Hello and welcome to New Scientist Weekly. I'm Rowan Hooper. And I'm Penny Sarche. Welcome to the show. This week there's a lot going on and we've got many guests, so we're going to introduce them one by one as they come on. But here are the stories. We're peering deeper and further into the universe than ever before with our analysis of the first images from the James Webb Space Telescope. Yeah, that's uh, such a cool story. We're also going to discuss a really weird story about how artificial intelligence can use your brainwaves to see things you can't. Uh, We've also got a piece on how we can unlock the genetic potential of wheat, which is kind of amazing because I I would have thought we'd already unlocked it after thousands of years of breeding, but we'll find out. And we're also hearing from a big human reproduction conference on how COVID is affecting fertility through its impacts on sperm. But we're going to start with a big xenotransplant breakthrough announced this week from NYU at New York University. And who better to tell us about this than our New York-based health reporter, Grace Wade. And uh, welcome, Grace, to the podcast, by the way. Great to have you on. Thanks. What's the story? Yeah, so first I should remind everyone, xenotransplantation is the transfer of animal organs into humans. And yesterday, researchers at NYU announced they had successfully transplanted a pig heart into two recently deceased humans on June 16th and July 6th. Both the patients had been declared brain dead, but were kept on life support before, during, and after the transplantation. Wow, that is incredible, isn't it? So the bodies were still alive. It does sound... I mean, I, you know, I'm very pro-science, but it almost sounds dystopian thing to do. Um, remind us why we want to use animal organs in human transplants. Yeah, it's pretty wild to think that one day we may have people walking around with pig hearts or other animal organs inside their bodies. Yeah. The reason doctors have been working on xenotransplantation for decades is because it offers a really promising solution for the shortage of organ donors. In the U.S., for example, 17 people die each day waiting for an organ transplant. And if we could use animal organs instead, that could save over 6,000 lives a year in this country alone. Wow. I didn't realize it was that many people on the on the list or the waiting list. And I can attest to this being a thing that people have been working on for decades because I wrote a novel once called Pig Heart about a man with a pig's heart. But how were these operations? How, how did they go? I mean, how can you tell how well an operation's gone if the body is dead. So there were no major problems during either surgery, according to the doctors, meaning both operations were successful. Both the pig hearts function normally inside the patients. They contracted and pushed blood throughout their bodies without help from a machine. But the doctors only observed the patients for 72 hours. So there's a lot more we need to know about longer transplants. But they ended the experiment after 72 hours, not because anything went wrong. That's just the timeline they decided on before conducting the surgery. And during that time, there were no signs of either body rejecting the organ, which is a main concern with xenotransplantation. So that feels like a a big advance. What did the researchers do to prevent rejection? So they used hearts from pigs with 10 genetic modifications meant to reduce the risk of rejection. They also gave the patients immune suppressing medications, which is standard for any transplant. So uh, forgive me for asking, but didn't this already happened. I I thought there was a pig transplant, a pig heart transplant into someone who was actually fully alive earlier this year. Yeah, that's right. So in January, a man named David Bennett became the first human to ever receive a pig heart. While it was a huge accomplishment in medicine, Bennett died two months later, and it's still not really clear why. Performing these types of transplants in deceased humans allows researchers to collect more data about them. For example, the doctors at NYU were able to collect daily biopsies on both patients after the operation. That's not something you could do in a living human because in that situation, a doctor's goal is to keep the patient comfortable and help them recover. Yeah, that makes sense. But when Bennett died, um, didn't the doctors detect a pig virus in his blood? Did they find that in these patients, I wonder? That is correct in good memory. But no, there were also no signs of infection in either patient, which is another big accomplishment. The virus that was detected in Bennett cannot infect human cells, but it did infect the transplanted heart and may have contributed to his passing. Mm. To avoid this, researchers at NYU developed and used a more sensitive screening method that could better pick up on low levels of this pig virus before the organ is transplanted into humans. That makes sense. So it's great that there's this new screening protocol and it seems to be working. But honestly, it feels like we've been talking about this for decades. Do we know how much closer we are to this actually being a a viable option for people who need donor organs? Yeah, so while these surgeries are a really big accomplishment, they're only the second and third successful transplant of a pig heart to a human. We have a long way to go before this becomes standard. 
Researchers hope that phase one clinical trials will begin in the next few years. But in the meantime, the doctors at NYU are going to continue performing this procedure in brain dead patients to collect more data. They plan to observe the patients for longer time periods, too. It's been another huge story this week with the first images from the James Webb Space Telescope. So what was that, $10 billion, years in the making, and now it's up there, it's working, and we're seeing deeper into the universe than ever before. Uh, Jacob, let's bring you in here. Has it been worth the wait? Well, it has been quite the wait. Uh, I think I've been writing, this is something the upcoming James Webb Space Telescope could answer at the bottom of astronomy stories <laughs> for the past decade. Uh, so it's fantastic yeah. that this science is actually now beginning. Uh, and yes, we can peer back up to 13.7 billion years ago, just after the Big Bang. Yeah, it's it's hard to fathom, isn't it? Um, well, let's talk about that, because some people call it a time machine. Um, but so how does it work? So it's it's a bit difficult to get your head around, but James Webb is so powerful that it's gathering light from objects that was emitted 13.7 billion years ago and is only just reaching us now after traveling across the cosmos. So essentially, we're seeing something that happened in the past. But the galaxies the telescope is seeing from this time are actually much further away than 13.7 billion light years because the entire universe has expanded as the light has traveled, stretching it. And that's why it's important that unlike Hubble, James Webb sees an infrared rather than visible light. The light from the furthest galaxies has been redshifted by the expansion of the universe. And so then, is it these distant galaxies that we see in that first image that was released on Monday by US President Joe Biden, the deep field? Yes, so if you've seen this image, you might have noticed that some of the galaxies look smeared out or even oddly curved. And that's because at roughly the center of the image, there's a cluster of galaxies relatively near to Earth that distorts the light from the distant universe through its gravitational pull, acting like a lens to magnify what's behind. Yeah, the scale is incredible. I saw someone at NASA saying that the, the slice that they were looking at covers a patch of sky approximately the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length by someone on the ground. So just that tiny, tiny bit zoomed in on. It's completely extraordinary. You've got literally thousands of galaxies containing <laughs> billions and billions of stars. Yeah. And this is just a tiny, tiny slice of the entire universe. Yeah. Ah! <laughs> so take us through what goes on in order to produce an image like this. How long does it take to collect the light for that image, for example? So the incredible thing that I found when NASA was describing this image, saying that uh, compared to the Hubble telescope's deep field images, which took two weeks to create, they actually took this one before breakfast. It only took a couple of hours <laughs> to, to gather the light, which, you know, it means we must be going to get some incredible pictures coming up when they do even longer exposures. And they are beautiful images. Um, but one of them that um, caught my eye as well was uh, of an exoplanet called WASP 96b, uh, very close, only 1,150 light years away. And what was amazing about that was we could see its atmosphere of that exoplanet. Yeah, so this isn't a traditional photograph, but rather a spectra. Uh, so JWST watches the Jupiter-like WASP 96b passed in front of its star, and it looked at the light filtering through the atmosphere of the planet from the star. And just as the colour of our atmosphere is determined by its composition, so the, the sky is blue because sunlight scatters off nitrogen, oxygen and other molecules in the air, the colour mm. or wavelengths JWST sees can let astronomers figure out the makeup of WASP 96b's atmosphere. And this was displayed as a sort of a wiggly graph that they were then trying to fit a curve to and suggested that they could find a lot of water molecules in the atmosphere. Wow. Um, uh, and we all know why, why we're excited about that. What if we look at some of the closer exoplanets, like, you know, Proxima Centauri is only four light years away. Could we see structures on the on the planet's surface, you know, alien cities, maybe? <laughs> so sadly, even though James Webb is, you know, the most powerful space telescope in existence, Proxima Centauri B, the, the nearest exoplanet to Earth, is very, very, very small. And so it wouldn't even show up as a pixel on the, uh, the James mm. Webb camera. But uh, I was looking at a paper earlier today saying that, you know, if they really, really push the telescope as hard as they can, they might be able to get some spectral information um, from Proxima Centauri B, uh, perhaps detecting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Yeah, and that, that's what um, James Lovelock always said was the best way to look for aliens was to look at um, look in the atmosphere as of exoplanets. So amazing if we can do that. 
Yes, I suppose one one issue with that is even in the solar system, we have difficulty figuring out uh, what's happening in the atmosphere. So you remember last year um, we had the news of uh, a, a component of Venus's atmosphere that some people were claiming could be due to life. That's still, you know, an open question, even as close to home as that. So I'm sure we on this podcast could come up with a long list of things we'd like to point the telescope at and decide on. But the scientific programme has already been mapped out, hasn't it? They, they know what they're going to be looking at first. Is there anything in particular that you're really looking forward to? It's really hard to choose, but I think diving into those deep field images like the, the first one that was released and learning more about the first ever stars will be really incredible. Because although the Big Bang is obviously the start of the universe, in a way, those first stars are the start of us. Those stars fused hydrogen and helium from the Big Bang, which in turn led to later generation stars. And those stars eventually produced all of the elements that make up everything that we know. And it's possible that some of the hydrogen atoms inside your body right now were once part of those first ever stars. (laughs) Oh, so it's yeah, that's what Carl Sagan said, wasn't it? We're all made of stars. Uh, It's amazing stuff. And it's only just starting. Uh, We've got a feature on what James Webb Space Telescope will be doing, and we'll put that in the show notes. And now some messages from our sponsors. People age at different speeds, and the date on your birth certificate may not represent your inner biological age at all. If you're looking for ways to extend your health span and slow down the aging process, the keys to health and longevity may run in your blood. That's why Inside Tracker provides you with a personalized plan to improve your metabolism, reduce stress, improve sleep, and optimize your health for the long haul. Inside Tracker analyzes your blood, DNA, and fitness tracking data to identify where you're optimized and where you're not. You'll get a daily action plan with personalized guidance on the right exercise, nutrition, and supplementation for your body. For a limited time, get 20% off the entire Inside Tracker store. Just go to insidetracker.com forward slash new scientist. That's insidetracker.com forward slash new scientist. Love, touch, speech, movement, consciousness. What do they all have in common? From before birth to the precipice of death, our brains underpin our experiences and feelings and they make us who we are. But how? In How We're Wired, a new podcast from the Bertarelli Foundation, evolutionary anthropologist and new scientist contributor Dr Anna Machin goes behind the scenes of cutting-edge neuroscience research to uncover the fascinating stories of how our brains grow, change and ultimately die. She'll introduce you to scientists exploring how the brain works and take you into labs developing life-changing technologies. From hormones to heartbreak, the podcast will be exploring true personal stories of people's lives and brains from birth to death, taking a deep look at the science that explains us all. This is How We're Wired from the Bertarelli Foundation. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. We're back and it's the sci-fi alert, the part of the show where Mm. science... (laughs) <laughs> the part of the show that Rowan loves, where science meets science fiction. So Carmela, this week you've got a story about AI um, and specifically about what AI can do with our brains, which sounds a lot scarier than it, than it actually is. So, so what is this story about? Right. So the research I reported on is essentially about helping your brain see things that your eyes can't quite see. So the setup involves an object that's hidden behind a wall and a person that's wearing an EEG headset. And that EEG headset uses the signal from the person's eyes to create images of the hidden object. Right. So that that sounds impossible. What's actually going on here? How does an EEG reading find information about something that you can't see? Yeah, it's pretty wild, but um, researchers use this technique that's called ghost imaging, which has actually been used before to reconstruct images of objects that are out of line of sight. So if you have some sort of faint shadows of something you can't see, ghost imaging can typically create an image anyway. So here in this experiment, the hidden object was illuminated with a special pattern, and the person could see some very faint reflections of that special pattern. And the EEG information about those reflections was fed into an AI that could both reconstruct the image or switch up the pattern if it detected that the eyes were not seeing enough shadows. So there's sort of a a feedback loop between the brain and the computer, and these shadows are key for for reconstructing the image. Uh, I love that they call it ghost imaging as well. Nice touch. But so the AI extracts information from our brain that the brain 
wouldn't be able to process so sharply by itself. Yeah, so this is one of the amazing things. Like I, I called up some neuroscientists for this story and they explained to me that most of our vision process is actually very unconscious and a lot of the physical signals that sit on our eye never get processed by the brain. The brain right. is sort of optimized to be crazy efficient and throws out a ton of information <laughs> And the EEG can pick up on some of that information that the brain would usually throw out. And this is where the AI steps in and sort of uses that information to show us things. Yeah, it is incredible, this, because I know a lot of consciousness researchers, they think about how the brain processes vision in the way, like you're saying, and they think about how, you know, how it creates an image that we think of as reality and what that means for consciousness. Uh, so I'd love to know what they make of this experiment. So can we then think about this setup as a sort of, AI-driven brain enhancement? Yeah, I think so. It's sort of like a brain-computer interface almost where it's not just like your eyes are controlling um, what a machine will do, but rather there's a little bit of a conversation between the brain and the computer where the computer can adjust to help the brain do things they usually couldn't do. Of course, I should say that like this tech is in very early days, so the hidden images have been you know, 16 by 16 pixels, and the whole thing, it takes about a minute to make an image, so mm. there's a lot more to do, but it is sort of like a sci-fi, like here's, here's how we get skills by just like putting helmets on our heads, you know? It's really interesting, and um, so uh, that leads me to ask you, Rowan, what's the sci-fi link here? <laughs> yeah, well, it, what it made me think of was the, the, the first Blade Runner movie where Harrison Ford you know, that bit where he gets his computer to enhance and just goes enhance, enhance, and he gets to see something that's not otherwise visible in the photo that he's found. But that, that's just an, an analogue to this work. And I think that, you know, this work is way cooler. Next up, we've got the very exciting finding that the world could double its wheat production by genetically tweaking the crop to better suit the different places where it's grown. Penny, yeah, so always very excited to talk about plant genetics, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this story really speaks to why it's such an important field of study. Let's start with a reminder of just how vital wheat is. It's one of the world's most widely grown crops. It's a staple crop for 35% uh, of the world's global population. Yeah, and obviously Ukraine is vital for that as well. I guess the concern is what happens as the population globally continues to grow. Yeah, and this week, actually, the UN announced that it expects the global population to hit 8 billion later this year, specifically, actually, on the 15th of November, according <laughs> to its projections. Precise. Um, but obviously, it won't stop there. And we're expecting more than 10 billion people on the planet in roughly 60 years time. So we need to find ways to grow much more food and, and preferably to do it without cutting down many more of the, the vital wild lands that we're, we're hoping our biodiversity can cling on in. Mm. Um, so there's a, quite a lot at stake. <laughs> yeah, just a bit. And obviously, uh, as the world gets warmer, farming is going to get harder. Yeah, um, so that, that's not going to help either. Hot temperatures stress out many crops, including wheat, and, and that reduces uh, yields. So with all of that in mind, that's why I found this new study so interesting and, and hopefully, you know, a, a real source of hope. Mm. Okay, go on then. What did they do? So it's a modelling study. So that is a caveat. Um, this is just modelling, but it is really interesting. Um, looking at climatic data from 53 places in 33 countries that grow wheat. So to put all of that together, they these places paint a picture of 91% of the places where wheat is grown worldwide. The model looked at these and estimated that we're currently getting an average of 49% of wheat's genetic potential when it comes to yield. Wow, that, that sounds like not very much, but what does it mean? Yeah, so what we're talking about here is how much more wheat could we get if we made sure that every place that grows wheat is growing a cultivar, essentially a breed, that is perfectly genetically suited to grow in the specific conditions of that place. Okay, um, and so do, what do we have to like gene edit all the different wheat for different locations yeah that's certainly one way but actually there are loads of different ways of doing plant breeding and, and making it as precise as possible so we have quite a, a, an armory for this kind of stuff it's probably not possible to fully close that gap though to create like a perfect genome for each place there might actually be constraints on the chromosomes and what you can actually do we probably can't go the whole way and even if you use a fast technique like gene editing which is much faster than some of the others to still adapt all these different bits of the genome to each place could still take quite a bit of time. 
Yeah. So what do we think of this finding then? Is it going to hold up? Well, one of the things that needs to be done potentially is to use a different computer model just to really check that um, this kind of quite big finding, we could essentially double wheat yields just by genetic changings, does sort of hold up. And when our reporter Adam Vaughan discussed the study with some independent experts, one said it would actually be much simpler to increase wheat yields uh, by improving the way that we grow it, better management of things like irrigation and fertilizer and so on. And another person said that uh, commercial wheat breeders in the UK, they're currently only managing to improve genetic yield, uh, as it's known, of wheat by about 1% a year. So to suggest that we could double wheat yields from genetic improvements really soon if anyone were to say that, would be quite fanciful. Yeah, but still worth exploring, right? Yeah, um, and there's precedent here, of course, because um, the Green Revolution of the 20th century involved various things, but most famously, Nobel Peace Prize winner Norman Borlaug introduced a high-yielding dwarf wheat variety, or several actually, to Mexico, India, Pakistan, and is often said to have saved billions of lives um, by giving them better wheat to grow. Yeah, uh, or that yeah, he's a real hero villain character, isn't he? Because you know he saved those lives, but the the wheat varieties needed loads of water, and then it led to pe- like loads of pesticide and fertilizer use, and and effectively gave us the system of gigantic monocultures and intensive farming that led us to rely on just a few crops worldwide for our food. And and some people say you know it's changed the the way the entire Earth system operates. Uh, and and like I know Borlaug didn't intend any of this. He was just wanting to buy time to feed the world. But then we we basically got locked into this intensive agriculture system. Yeah, I, and you know there are real problems with intensive agriculture. I, I guess the two things I'd say to that was one, a lot of the lives that were saved were subsistence farmers who are growing ineffective and really difficult to manage crops. So it is possible to have better crops without necessarily going down a, a really eco damaging route and two often we end up sort of conflating the idea of genetic improved crops and intensive agriculture but actually they don't have to go hand in hand and a lot of people are working on developing crops with beneficial genes that will mean hopefully we'll use less water and fewer pesticides and and less fertilizer and so on so quite exciting to see some of the developments that could come out there. Now we're going to turn to COVID. And just before we're recording this, I saw that the ONS, the Office of National Statistics here in the UK, has shown that recorded COVID deaths here in the UK have passed 200,000. And that gives Britain one of the highest death tolls and death rates in Europe. And I always think of that when I hear the government claiming success for the COVID response by having the fastest vaccine rollout in Europe. Um, But this time we want to talk about something a bit different about COVID. Our reporter, Carissa Wong, has been at a really big human reproduction meeting. Carissa, what have you found there? Yeah, so this is the European Society of Human Reproduction and Embryology meeting in Milan. Unfortunately, I didn't get to go there, but I attended it remotely from my computer. And it's a massive conference covering loads of cool stuff about reproduction. Um, But one recurring story that sort of caught my eye is about how COVID affects sperm. It's not something I'd really thought much about before. And basically, it looks like COVID-19 infections can lower sperm counts for months. And this virus can sometimes even be found in semen and might even directly bind to sperm cells. But I should say straight away that that's not totally surprising because we do see similar fertility changes in other illnesses that involve fever, like the flu. Okay, so that's good to know. But I guess it is yet another thing we're finding out about COVID. What? So it's obviously a measurable decline in fertility, is it? Yeah, so scientific studies has found a decline um, in an Indian study that looked at men who were seeking fertility treatment even before the pandemic. Researchers found an average 49% decline in sperm count around 10 weeks after recovering from COVID-19. So that's about a half reduction in sperm count. So that adds to evidence that this illness's effects on sperm might take several months to subside. And so that particular study was in men who were already seeking fertility treatment, so probably had um, sort of issues there already. Is there any way of knowing if COVID is having an effect on fertility in the population more broadly, people who aren't necessarily having difficulty conceiving? 
Yeah, that's a really good question. And, and there have been other studies showing a temporary drop in sperm count following SARS-CoV-2 infection. And one study that came out last year in 2021 looked at sperm samples from 180 men aged at 34 on average after they'd caught COVID-19. In that case, within a month after a positive PCR test, the researchers found that in 37% of 35 participants, sperm counts dropped to below 15 million sperm cells per milliliter of semen, which is a lower than average sperm count. And then about two months after infection, this fell to 6% of 32 participants. So there was some recovery. Okay, so it takes quite a long time to recover. Do we know what happens later on? Are there longer lasting effects still? Well, yeah, some scientific studies have looked at this. So in the Indian study of men seeking fertility treatment, 21 weeks after the infection, most of the men had recovered somewhat, though still not to where they were before. And then three of the men did not show any recovery in sperm count at all by this time. So that supports previous evidence that a minority of people may have permanent testicular damage after SARS-CoV-2 infection. Yeah, so that's, that's quite worrying. Yeah, little. Although the researcher, I, one of the researchers I spoke to said, we shouldn't worry too much at this point as we don't actually have evidence that there are permanent effects yet. But having said that, I did see a report suggesting that COVID-19 can also affect sperm motility, so how they move and shape. And there's some evidence that COVID can infect cells in the testes and a tube where sperm cells mature that sits behind the testes called the epididymis. And one imaging study showed that 42% of men um, with mild to moderate cases of COVID-19 appear to have inflammation in this tube where sperm cells mature. Thanks, Carissa. And we'll post a link to Carissa's report on the conference in our show notes. And that's it for this week. Thanks to our guests, Jacob Aaron, Camilla Padovich callahan Grace Wade and Carissa Wong. And thanks to you for listening. Before you go, though, we must tell you about an upcoming online event in our Being Human series. Yeah, this is How to Be a Human by Camilla Pang. Camilla won the Royal Society Book Prize in 2020, and she'll be telling us all about understanding the strange species that we are. It's on Thursday, the 8th of September at 6pm. Go to newscientist.com slash beinghuman to find out more and book your ticket. That's going to be a great talk. Do remember to rate our show and subscribe and tell every single person you know to listen. I'm Benny Sarche. And I'm Rowan Hooper. Bye for now. Take care. See you next week. Bye. 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 This podcast is produced by OG Podcasts. Find out more at ogpodcasts.co.uk.